least you could make it this evening. And before we close, I would like to thank... Mr. Mr. Chairman, I saw dozens of questions in the box there, and you ended with two. I don't know the people are there satisfied, but I saw dozens there, dozens. I can't understand why in two questions, you know, the meeting is closed. I can't understand. I don't know. An unusual and rough moment occurred in Sheikh Ahmed Didat's lecture in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which entitled, Islam the Message of Peace and Truth, that was held on February 21, 1992. This event was suspected of interference from the chairman who ended the lecture suddenly, and inevitably this situation made Sheikh Didat very disappointed until he finally walked out. Now I wish to call upon His Eminence, Sheikh Ahmad Didat to deliver his speech. Alhamdulillah Wada. والصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مفتح الابواب ويا مسبب الاسباب ويا دليل الحاضرين توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين وافضل امر الى الله ان الله قصير العباد اعوذ بالله من الشيط اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا اهل الكتاب قل يا اهل الكتاب تعالوا الى كلمه سواء بيننا وبينكم ان لا نعبد الا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من دون الله فان تولوا فكلوا اشهدوا بان مسلمون صدق الله صدق الله العظيم مستر تشيرمان and my dear brothers and sisters the topic islam the message of peace islam the message of truth that is the topic that has been given to me alhamdulillah you know the meaning of the word islam islam means peace coming from the word salam salam means peace in its religious sense, it means a religion of total submission to the will of Allah. Islam is a religion of total submission to the will of Allah. And truth, what is truth? Al-Haq, what is Haq? Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, he was questioned by Pontius Pilate at his trial. What? is truth. Unfortunately, the Gospels do not record the answer. But Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran what truth is. He says, Al-Haqqu min Rabbikum wa la takun min al-mumtareen. So truth comes from Allah alone. So do not be of those in doubt. Whatever comes from Allah is Haqq is the truth. He is Al-Haq, the source of truth, and what he reveals, what he informs his creation is Haq, the Kitab Ul-Haq. This is the Quran, Allah's Kalam. It tells you everything that Allah says is Haq. And if mankind wants peace, there is no way to get peace unless you are in tune with the source of peace. You have no truth unless you are in contact with the source of truth. 
And we in the house of Islam, we believe that Allah Ta'ala in his final revelation, he has given this haq to us in the form of the Holy Quran. Today, this day, this very day, at the present moment, in Senegal, His Holiness the Pope is busy. In the Muslim country of Senegal, he is busy. We are told in the star of this morning, the star newspaper, calling itself the people's paper, the star, you read there about His Holiness, that he's now visiting that area of Africa where the Muslims are in a majority. And he is urging his people, the Christian world, the Roman Catholic Church in particular. He is the head of 850 million Roman Catholics. His Holiness the Pope. And His Holiness the Pope has just made a proclamation. You get this morning star and you read there, he is making his wish known to the world that he wants to have a dialogue with the Muslims. Dialogue. You know what's a dialogue? A friendly chat, an exchange of views, communication between one group of people and another, in this particular instance, with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, this is his eighth visit to Africa. Eighth time he's gone now to Africa. When he was in Nigeria, he made a proclamation that he wanted to have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Turkey, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. Look, this is what Allah Bari Ta'ala is telling us in the Holy Quran. In the ayah I read to you, from Surah Ali Imran. Surah Ali Imran. Where do you find Imran? In the Holy Quran, if you have a translation like this particular one I have in my hand, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, this Quran, at the back of it, there is a very comprehensive index. Anything you want to know, everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know? You want to know about marriage in Islam, and the M, just like in a dictionary, you'll find marriage. Everything about marriage, with whom you can and with whom you can't. How many? How many? Open the book, under marriage, you'll, Allah will tell you how many and how. What do you want to know? You want to know about heaven, under H. You want to know about hell, under H. You want to know about Jesus, under J. You want to know about Moses, under M. What do you want to know? about creation and the sea, whatever you want, everything on your fingertips in this encyclopedia of Islam, the Holy Quran by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And this Quran, I'm happy to know, to tell you, that is made available for you at the exits. They are available at a price. A veritable encyclopedia for, of 2,000 pages. You owe it to yourself that you avail yourself of the benefits that you can derive from a translation such as this. In Surah Ali Imran, if you want to know where Imran is in the Quran, you don't start paging through, paging through 2,000 pages to find where Imran is. What you do, go to the index and look for the word Imran and the I. And it will tell you chapter 3. And 3 is easy to find because every page is numbered. Once you have found chapter 3, I am now telling you ayah number 64. 64 is easy to find because every verse is numbered. Once you have found it, read it. At home, make a practice that whenever any person delivers a talk and he gives you a Quranic reference, make a point of going home and checking it up. Not that you doubt the speaker, but for your own benefit. Once you go and check it up, you see it with your own eyes, you read it in your mind, and you at times read it audibly that you can hear, that part of that message will become your own property. And you in turn will be able to share it with other people. You owe yourself this privilege, this honor. 
go and refer to any reference in the Holy Quran. Verse 64 of Ali Imran. Allah says, Qul, tell them. Ya Ahl al-Kitab. Say, O oh, people of the book. O oh, people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Our learned men will tell us unanimously that these are the Jews and the Christians. Ahl al-Kitab means Jews and Christians. Allah Bari Ta'ala is telling us to call them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab Ta'ala. Ta'ala, come, come. Ila kalimatin sawaim bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Let us get together for the sake of mankind, for the sake of peace, for the sake of God. Let us get together on a common platform. And the basis of getting together, Allah gives us the conditions. I want somebody to tell me they are unreasonable. I want to find people to tell me that these are unre unreasonable conditions. Number one, Allah says, Allah illallah, that we worship none but Allah, wala nushrika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with Him, wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah, and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallaw, fa'kulu shahadu bianna muslimun, but if they turn back, Tell them that we are Muslims, meaning that we have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Whatever Allah wants us to do, we are prepared to do. But let us get together in the fellowship of faith, in the worship of the one true God. Only, there is only one God, and let us worship Him, whom we Muslims call Allah. And Muhammad sallam, is not our Allah. Inform the people, let them know. But there are millions of people who don't know these things. They think that we Muslims are the Antichrists, the Dajjals, the enemies of Jesus. They do not know that in this Holy Quran are enshrined the virtues of Maryam salam, the mother of Jesus. And this mighty messenger of God, Jesus, his birth is described in two places in the Holy Quran. They don't know that we Muslims, we believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. That we believe in his miraculous birth. That we believe that he was the Messiah, the Messiah, translated Christ. And we believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. In my country, when I tell this to the, my fellow countrymen, the Christians, they are thinking that I'm trying to curry favor with them, trying to be nice to them, that if I scratch their back, they might scratch my back. If I can say a few good words about the Jesus, they in turn might say a few good words about Abu Nabi Karim Sallallahu Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, that's far from the truth. The Holy Quran in this has enshrined what I'm telling you about. There is a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ, Surah Maryam. It happens that in the Christian Bible, there is no such book. This Christian Bible, I have in my hand, the Old and the New Testament put together. This particular one of the Roman Catholics, I'm sorry, this one of the Protestant world has 66 books inside. 66. The Roman Catholic version has 73 books inside. 73 booklets put together, creates the encyclopedia called the Bible. In those 73 books of the Roman Catholics and 66 of the Protestants, there is not a single book entitled Mary. You open the Quran and you find chapter Mary, Surah Maryam. Now you have to inform this to people. His Holiness the Pope, he wants to have a dialogue. Wherever he goes, he wants to have a dialogue with the Muslims. The late Tunku Abdul Rahman, when I met him in 1984, he told me, that the Pope wanted to have a dialogue with him. And I asked him, what happened? Well, look, that dialogue was of, was of another kind. It's another kind of dialogue, not the dialogue that I'm having with you now. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim, you are seated here. I'm having a chat with you. I'm explaining to you the position. But with Tunku, Abdul Rahman, the, His Holiness the Pope, had a dialogue of another kind. With Abdullah Nasif of the Rabita, the World Assembly of the... the the Rabita World Islamic Conference, he also had another dialogue. 
but it's of another kind which the world didn't know. I don't know whether you knew that our own Tunku Abdul Rahman, he had a dialogue with His Holiness. Does anybody know? Can anybody put up his hand and say, look, he knew about this dialogue that Tunku Abdul Rahman had with the Pope? Anybody knows? Please put up your hand. I can't see any. Our Tunku had a dialogue, but that was of another kind. But suppose His Holiness was here today with us. I would have in all humility approached him. Your Holiness, the Quran tells us to have a dialogue with you. Ta'ala, ta'ala. Allah tells us to call them ta'ala, ta'ala. And in the book of Isaiah, also the Holy Bible tells you, come, let us reason together. Come, let us reason together. So, we are going to have a little dialogue. Though I had tried to have a dialogue with him, I had written to him, but unfortunately it didn't come about. But hypothetically, this evening, let us say that His Holiness is here with us today, and we want to have a dialogue with Him, and we start. I start by asking His Holiness, Your Holiness, what does the Bible, your Bible, your Holy Bible says about Muhammad? What do you expect to hear from Him? or any learned man of Christianity, the priests, parsons, predicants, ministers, bishops, archbishops, without hesitation, they will tell us nothing. If you ask any Christian, what does the Bible, your Bible say about Muhammad, they will tell you nothing. You may ask, why nothing? Does not the Holy Bible speak about the, the rise of Israel? the rise of communism, and even the beast. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it speaks about a beast, and it even speaks about Gog and Magog. Yajuj, Majuj. All these things are mentioned in the, in the Bible. They will say yes, they are. Then surely it must have something to say about this mighty messenger of God, Muhammad, who made it possible for one billion Muslims today, one billion, one thousand million Muslims in the world, to believe in Jesus. Because no Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. This man, Muhammad وسلم, who made that possible, surely there must be something about him in the Bible. The man will tell you, he says, son, my son, if there was anything, I would have known it. I would have seen it. I would have recognized it. But this word Muhammad is not to be found anywhere in the Bible. You may, if you have my book, it is being given out, what the Bible says about Muhammad, there is a reference there that in the Hebrew Bible, in the original Hebrew language, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 16, verse 5, it says, Hikko, Mamitakim we kullo Muhammadim zehdudi we zehrei bayna Jerusalem. The word there is Muhammadim, which is Muhammad with respect and honor. In the Hebrew language, there are two types of plurals: plural of respect and plural of numbers. This is a plural of respect. As we read the Quran, as Allah says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. Who is this us? Father, Son and Holy Ghost? No, we don't believe in that. Who? Allah, Jibreel and Muhammad? Astaghfirullah. No. Who is this we? Who is this us? We know that in the Arabic language, this is a plural of respect. Allah is talking about himself like the royal we, the royal plural. So, Muhammadim, Muhammad is mentioned by name. But the Christian world in the translations, they have translated the word Muhammadim into the word altogether lovely. So when you read the English Bible, it says altogether lovely. You can't imagine that they're talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa like for example, if it was the praised one, Muhammad means the praised one. If it was written the praised one, you won't think, you can't imagine this talking about Muhammad So, we said, now let us reason, let us reason. There are chapters and verses in the Holy Bible where our Nabi Kareem is referred to. 
and we may we may draw the attention of the Christian world to the book of Deuteronomy. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. I took the trouble, before coming to this country, before leaving South Africa, to learn these verses in your language in your sweet language. And in case, in case, I happen to, to mutilate your language, to murder your language, I know you good people, you will be kind enough to overlook my shortcomings. I assure you that whatever I say, the way I pronounce, it is not intentionally wanting to mutilate your language. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, in the Malay Bible, it says, Ulangan, 18, verse 18 and 19. Se orang nabi akan kubangkitkan, I will raise them up a prophet. Se orang nabi akan kubangkitkan, bagi mereka dari antara saudara mereka from among the brethren seperti engkau ini like unto thee like you like who like Hazrat Musa alaihi salam seperti engkau ini aku akan menaruh farmanku dalam mulutnya and i will put my words in his mouth who's talking God Almighty is talking to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, telling him that Allah bari ta'ala will raise up for them, for the Jews, a prophet from among the brethren, from the Bani Ismail, the children of Ismail, because the Israelites and the Ishmaelites, the Arabs, are brothers coming from Father Abraham. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. The children of Sarah are the Jews and the children of Hajra are the Arabs. And as such, they are brothers. Saudara mereka, from among the brethren. Dan ia akan mengatakan kepada mereka segala yang kuperintahkan kepadanya. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Orang yang tidak mendengarkan segala fermanku. Orang yang tidak Mendengarkan, hearken, listen to, and whosoever will not hearken, listen to, mendengarkan, hearken, listen to, hear, to hear, hearken, segala fermanku, all that I tell him, yang akan diucapkan nabi itu demi namaku, which he shall speak in my name. In Arabic, be ismi. In Malayation, de mi namaku, in my name. Dari padanya akan kutuntut pertanggung jawaban. To me sounds most musical. Dari padanya akan kutuntut pertanggung jawaban. Say, I will make him, if you don't listen to this man, this messenger of God, when he's going to come speaking in my name, I will fix you up. In the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, it says, I will take revenge, revenge. Allah is prepared to take revenge on anybody who not, will not listen to that prophet come, who comes along and speaking in Allah's name, be ismi. Now the most important part of this prophecy, we will deal with every phrase, inshallah. Every phrase will expound that this fits our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like a glove. If the glove is specially made for you or for him, it fits him like a glove. The most important phrase is seperti engkau ini, seperti engkau ini. I hope you understand my Malay. You understand my Malay? Seperti engkau ini, like unto thee, like you, like Moses. So, we want to know how is Jesus as a candidate for Christianity, and Muhammad وسلم, how do they fare in being like Moses? So we are going to do this little bit of 
dialogue as if His Holiness the Pope was with us here tonight. Your Holiness. You see, Jesus Christ is not a candidate for this prophecy. Because, in the first place, Moses and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa may Allah bless them both, bless them all, they had a father and a mother. Moses and Muhammad, they both had fathers and mothers. But Jesus only had a mother. He had no human father. Is that true? And any Christian will admit that that is true. Moses and Muhammad both had fathers and mothers. Jesus had only a mother. So we can say, Awleh, Awleh karana itu, Nabi Isa, Tidak safarti Nabi Musa, Tatafi Nabi Muhammad, Adala safarti Nabi Musa. Therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number two. Moses and Muhammad were both born in the normal course of things. A man and a woman coming together, like any one of us. But Jesus Christ was created by a special miracle. The Holy Bible records that before they came together, Mary and Joseph the carpenter, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. And in the Gospel of St. Luke, when this good news was given to Maria Salam about the birth of her Holy Son, she says, how can this thing be when I know not a man? Meaning sexually, I have no experience of a male. How can I have a son? So, the angel is made to say that the Holy Ghost will come upon thee and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. In the Holy Quran we are told when the same, same situation arises that Jibre, the, the angel of God comes to Maryam salam, and gives her the good news about the birth of a Holy Son. She says, She said, Oh my Lord, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? Meaning physically, sexually. What does the angel say to that? Says, Qala Allahu yakhluku ma yasha. See, even so, Allah creates what He wills. Wa iza qada amran, fa inna ma yakulu lahu kun fa yakun. Say, whenever He decrees a matter, Allah decrees anything. He just says, kun bi, and fa yakun, it happens. This is the Muslim concept of the birth of Jesus. That without any male intervention, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was born. Moses and Muhammad, both born in the normal course of things. Jesus, born by a special miracle. Ask the Christian, is it true? And without hesitation, the Christian, any Christian worth the name will admit that it is true. So you can say, Awli karana itu, Nabi, Nabi Isa, Tidak safarti Nabi Musa, Tatafi Nabi Muhammad, Adala safarti Nabi Musa. Therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is like Moses. Number three, Moses and Muhammad both married and they begat children. A normal human life, both. They both married and begat children. But Jesus remained a bachelor all his life. Is it true? Ask the Pope. Then he will tell you yes. Or any Christian will say yes. So therefore, we say, Awleh karana itu Nabi Isa tidak safarti Nabi Musa Tatafi Nabi Muhammad Adala safarti Nabi Musa May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all Therefore We say Jesus is not like Moses But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is like Moses Number four Jesus Moses and Muhammad they both had a rough time. The people, they didn't accept them wholeheartedly without the struggle. To Hadrat Musa alayhi salam, his people gave them endless trouble in the desert for 40 years. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi salam, you know, for 13 years he suffered in Makkah. He had to make the hijrah to Medina. And even in Medina, they didn't leave him alone. You remember Badr and Uhad and Khandak. No peace, no peace. But before Hazrat Musa salam, died, or Hazrat Isa, Hazrat uh, Nabi Karim salam, he died, both the people, both the people, they accepted the prophets as the messengers of God. They gave them trouble, 
but before they died, they were accepted as prophets by their people in their lifetime. But Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. He came unto his own, mean the Jews, he came for them, but they all rejected him. And even after 2,000 years of Christianity, 2,000 years, his people as a whole have rejected Jesus. They call him an imposter, and as a false prophet, they say they killed him on the cross. Whereas we say, Allah says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ They didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. But according to you, our Christian brethren, we can ask them, is that true? That Moses and Muhammad both were accepted by the people in their lifetime. Whereas Jesus was rejected in his lifetime, even now for 2,000 years. Is it true? And he has to admit it is true. We say, Aule karana idu. I think you'll remember. By the time I'm finished, I'm sure you'll have by heart at this. Aule karana itu Nabi Isa tidak safarti Nabi Musa tatafi Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi Adala safarti Nabi Musa. Therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is like Moses. Number five. You see, Moses and Muhammad, they were both prophets as well as kings. A prophet is a person who receives inspiration, wahi, revelation from Allah, to guide their fellow brethren. That's a prophet of God, the mouthpiece of God. They speak the word of God, but they're not gods. Among them, we believe. Um, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and on and on and on. We accept them all. You see, there are endless number of points you'll get from my book. These books are being given to you. I want you to learn these verses, memorize them. In English, your English will improve. In the Malay language, it's your language. But if you have memorized, you'll be able to speak to the people. You will be able to share with them and you'll find an opportunity, endless opportunities. Endless opportunities of sharing our deen with the people of the book, the Ahl al-Kitab. Allah says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, ta'ala. Come, come. Call them, talk to them, invite them home for a cup of tea, and show them our Islamic brotherhood, our fellow feeling, our sincerity. And in that way, we show the bond that Islam has created for us, that we in the house of Islam, though we are so many different nations, Allah Baritala has made it possible for us to get together. Only last night in my room in the hotel, we all young people were seated there, I was the oldest of them, and I noticed something, and I was telling them, I said, you know what, we are not thinking at all. You know, we are so united, we are such brotherly people that we do not know that there are four different nations sitting in my room. Four different nations in my room, and we were not conscious of it. I first said three, and somebody corrected me, he says four. What were those four nations? They were a quarter dozen Malays, one nation a quarter dozen Hindi Muslims from India, another nation. Then we had an Arab, another nation. And we had a Chinese Muslim, Brother Sikandar, who has been working so hard to organize this meeting. Another nation, four nations. Allah Baritala makes us to come together five times a day, every day of the year. He brings us together in the worship of the one true God. We are made to stand shoulder to shoulder. No gaps left between one individual and another. Because our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps between you and your brother for the devil to get in. What devil? 
Anybody seen the devil? You know, usually we see in religious pictures, the devil is portrayed with horn, sharp ears, a tail with a barbed hook, with a ruddy complexion. Anybody seen one like that? No. The devil that our Nabi Kareem sallallahu was speaking about was not the one we see in the art galleries, but he was talking about ourselves. The devil of racism. I am Malay, this man is a Chinese. I am rich, he is poor. That kind of a devil is not allowed to come in between our brother, so we stand shoulder to shoulder, packed, no gaps left between one devotee and another. Then once, twice a year, we are made to go to the Eidgah, a bigger gathering. On Fridays we gather at the, for Juma in the big, big masjids. And again, during the Eidain, I don't know whether we have the practice here in Malaysia, but in my country we are trying to revive it. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu had said that when the Eidains come, the two Eids, one after Ramadan and the other Eid al-Adha, the Eid of sacrifice, we are ought to go out in the open fields, like this one here, and every other open field that you can think of, go for your salat, you will eat there. And our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also said that when you go for the Eidain, take the women and children with you. And he said something more than that. He said, even menstruating women, ask your alims, he said, even menstruating women, you know in the house of Islam, menstruating women do not offer salat. Then what you do with them? Why, why give them this extra trouble of gathering them in open places like this? There is a psychology. The psychology behind it is this, that if the, even the menstruating woman, she comes along, she brings her little ones also with. Can you imagine? The husband, the wife, the little one, the big one, and all the children, including ourselves, the whole, all are there. And it creates an impression in any situation, like in my country. When we do that, we know in the small towns, the people come to see, so what, so many Muslims? As a whole, in the country, we are less than 2%. Less than 2%. For every 100 people, there are only about two Muslims. For every 100, there are only two Muslims. But the impression is that so many Muslims, it boosts the morale of the Muslims and it terrifies the enemies of Islam. We didn't know that there were so many Muslims in the Cape. There are so many Muslims in Durban. There are so many Muslims in Johannesburg. So it's a psychological factor. Our Nabi Karim knew this, this secret of the psychology that go and create this bond. وَاَقْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّدُ Allah tells us, and get together, hold fast, all of you together. And don't be divided among yourselves. Get together. Then once in a lifetime, if one can afford, we are told to go for Hajj. If you can afford. If you can fulfill certain requirements. One is financial, and the other is other social obligations. You may have the money, and you have the health to take that long journey, but you have a grown-up daughter in the house, ready for marriage, and she's unmarried. What does Islam say? It says, get her married first. Allah can wait. Get her married first. You have the money, but you're owing somebody. You are in debt. He said, pay your debt first. Allah can wait. Allah is not needed. He doesn't need your hajj. He does not need your umrah. Get the girls married first because left alone at home, the mother is there, but is not the same as the father being there. So once in a lifetime you gather together and you discover Muslims from all over the world, all sh shades of color, and you realize that I didn't know you would say, I would say, and meet the Chinese Muslims. Is what Muslims from China? Chinese Muslims? Says, yes, there are more than 50 million Chinese Muslims. We didn't know that. Then we find that they Tamil Muslims, people from Tamil Nadu, from the south of India. In my country, almost 100% of the Tamils from South India are all Hindus. They are now rapidly getting Christianized, but 
They are all Hindus. So to us, every Tamil is a Hindu. Every Tamil is a Hindu. But now when we go for Hajj, we find that there are Tamil Muslims speaking the Tamil language and lecturing in the Tamil language. Unknown to us. Men from Ethiopia, men from Nigeria, men from Ghana, Muslims, Muslims from Turkey with blonde hair and blue eyes. Muslims, Muslims from Malaysia, from Indonesia. Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala has given us a system of how we can be united in a brotherhood of faith. We are to make use of this and spread this brotherhood. It is the bounden duty of every Muslim, man, woman and child, that we read the Quran, we understand it and we share it with everybody around. This is the bounden duty. Allah Ta'ala will question us on the Day of Judgment. It is the trust which He has given us. And if we do not fulfill the trust, He warns us in the Holy Quran. He says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمٍ غَيْرَكُمْ That if you do not carry out your duties and obligations, which Allah has imposed upon you, for being the khaira ummah and the best of people, we are, Allah tells us, the best of people. What makes us the best of people? Ah, I know why. Because we are Malays. No, nothing to do with you being Malay. Or we are Arabs. Nothing to do with that. Or we are Turks. Or we are Afghans, Patans, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis. Nothing to do with that. What makes us the best of people? Allah says, Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. These are your qualifications. You are the best of people. When Allah gives you this high and noble status, this high and noble status of being the best of people, it imposes certain responsibilities. There is no honor, no status without responsibility. You mean to say Allah makes us the best of people without responsibility? No. Responsibility is that you share this deen with other people. And if you do not, he says, Yastaddil qawman ghayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakunu amthalakum. Then they won't be like you. They won't be like you. In other words, this is an eternal law of Allah Ta'ala that if you don't do your job, O Muslims, willy-nilly you'll find things working, the sand will be taken away from under your feet, you will definitely collapse. Allah Ta'ala, in the first instance, He chose the Jews. He chose the Jews for His special favors. We are told in the Holy Quran, Allah says, Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati allati anamtu alaykum wa anni faddaltukum ala l'alameen. Say, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you, that I chose you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors, for guiding mankind. This was the favor. Allah chose them that they should become the torchbearers of his wahdaniyat to the rest of mankind. But they made the religion a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. If you want to become a Jew, they don't want you. They don't want you. They don't want us in their fold. They want to keep you out. It's a racial religion. Allah says, Yes, that will come and hire them. He'll substitute in your place another people. And this is an eternal law. Again and again, we find Allah Ta'ala took away that honor, that privilege from the hands of the Jews and bestowed it upon the Arabs. Allah chose the Arabs. Now we read in the Quran that address was addressed to the Arabs and through them to us and through us to the rest of mankind. This is the responsibility of every Muslim, whether Malay or Indonesian, Indian Muslim or Pakistani, whether Arab or Ajam, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you say you are a Muslim, we are bound by this order. You don't do the job, just khayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. And they won't be like you. Allah Ta'ala gives us riches. As a test, as a trial. See, we are made to ask in our dua, in our prayers. So, Rabbana, O oh our Lord, Atina, give us fi dunya hasanatan, the good thing of this world's life. Wa fil akhirati hasanatan, and the good things of the hereafter. Wa kin azab an nar, and save us from the chastisement of the fire. Beautiful. We are made to ask for the good things of this world's life. It's not a sin to have good homes, air-conditioned homes, 
even to have swimming pool in your homes if you can afford it, to have Mercedes Benzes, not a sin. Good food, good clothing, not a sin. Allah wants you to ask for all his blessings. But these blessings can become a curse. Allah can give this to you as a test and a trial. And he is warning us. That when they had disregarded the warnings we had given them, the warnings as contained in the Holy Quran, the whole Quran is contained with examples, examples after examples. Don't do what the others did. The cancer that overtook them is going to overtake you. Be on guard. So, Allah, if you don't listen to Him, you don't carry out His messages, you don't share the faith with others, this is right. We open up for them our doors of plenty, the horns of plenty. Everything. While in the midst of their enjoyment thereof, we call them to account all of a sudden. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? and put them into utter despair. And the wrongdoers are cut off to the last remnant. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allah says, in that case, we lift up our hands towards heaven. We thank you for eliminating these parasites. They, you chose them, you put them into such wonderful positions, status, gave them riches, gave you them intelligence, you gave them natural resources, but they abused them. They didn't use them the way they ought to have used. So, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. He will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakun umthalakum. Then Allah says they won't be like you. It has happened again and again in history, and it can happen again. We have to be on guard, continuously be vigilant, with regards to our responsibilities. So this is the message which I bring to you from my country, South Africa, from the House of Islam. And I bring to you peace and salutations from that deeper south of Africa. If you look at the map of the continent of Africa, at the bottom most point you'll find a country called Republic of South Africa. In that country they live about half a million Muslims. 50% of them are Malays. Believe me, they are called Malays in my country. Where do they come from? I don't know whether you know, you didn't send them. They were not missionaries. They were not businessmen with ships of their own to go along and do business in South Africa. How did they get there? We are told by history that some 300 years ago, when the Dutch conquered Indonesia, those of our brethren who were fighting for their freedom, they were captured as, as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. When the British conquered Malaysia, those of our brethren who were fighting for their freedom, they were also captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. For 300 years they were being hammered by the Christians to convert them to Christianity, 300 years. But after 300 years of hammering, they retained Islam. And they are a wonderful people. Wallah, they are a wonderful people, just like yourselves. Simple, humble, sweet people like yourselves. But they are not that sweet. You can't you can't swallow them. You can't swallow them. They have 300 years of hammering has made them quite a tough people. You can't swallow them easily. It's 300 years the Christians failed to convert them. They managed to change the language. They lost the language. They lost the language. They lost the surnames. You find them, the Malays, they look like you. Wallah, they look like you. No exaggeration. When you are there in their midst, you think you are in Kuala Lumpur or you are in Jakarta. You will not think that you are in South Africa when you are in their midst. They look like you, Alhamdulillah. They behave like you. They bacha the Quran just like you. These Malays, beautiful people. Now, 
they lost their language and they lost their surnames. They carry Christian surnames. How did that happen? You see, they were forced to pray in hiding, in secret. The Christians wouldn't allow them that freedom of religion, which they had for themselves, not for the Malays. So what did they do? In hiding, they get together in people's homes. And in that hiding, they bash out the Quran, Yasin, they all read together, beautiful sing-song way, like you do. Yasin, well, Quran, Il Hakim, all together. Then, Asma'ul Husna. Wallahu al-lazi la ilaha illahu al-malik al-kuddus al-salam al-mu'min al-muhaymin al-nazi. The way you do. Same, same, same. 300 years because they did that, they retained Islam. Another community, uh, which we were Indian Muslims, we have been lost long ago. In a similar period of time, the Afro-Americans, from Africa they were taken, they were Muslims, most of them, but in 300 years they lost, lost Islam altogether. But these Malays of the Cape, call them Cape Malays there, these Malays, they have written Islam, and you can look forward to meeting them in Makkah and Medina when you go for Hajj, when you go for Umrah and strengthen this bond, bring them to your country, learn things from them, and you share your love and feeling with them, and strengthen this bond that exists between the Muslims, especially beginning with your own people from South Africa. With these words, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity of coming and speaking to you this evening. And at the end of it, I don't know what the chairman has announced in the Malay language, is question time. And you are now in a position to ask questions. You can ask questions in writing, I'm told. You have to write the questions and send them in as quick as possible. And as quick as possible, we can get started in answering them. And at the end of question time is the finish of the meeting. So I ask you well, I wish you well, and I say, Wa dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you, Sheikh Didat. It's now time for questions. I have got a few questions. But uh, I think it's only fair that this question is directly to, directed to Didat. And uh, hopefully, he would answer in English and uh, I would be able to translate, if possible, into the Malay language. Now, we have two questions already, but somehow or other, I think the committee feels that the questions are quite long-winded, and that is not straight to the point. Now, I would suggest, if anyone would like to ask questions, be as brief as possible, because we don't have that much time. And then, of course, Sheikh Didat would reply also briefly, because give all others a chance to question Sheikh Didat. Anybody, because I have earlier said, if you have questions, you put it on paper. Kiranya ada soalan-soalan, tuliskan dengan kertas, antarkan kepada kami, supaya kami dapat menjawab dan meneliti soalan-soalan itu, sebab untuk menjimatkan masa. Kita boleh duduk sini dan Syekh Didat berjanji dia boleh duduk sini sampai pagi pun tak apa. Tapi masalahnya, kita akan berhentikan majlis ini dalam kira-kira sepuluh setengah. Itulah pengambil lambat. Silalah siapa-siapa nak bertanya. Tuliskan atas kertas sebagai tanda bukti soalan-soalan itu sesuai atau tidak sesuai. Maklumlah banyak masalah yang akan timbul. Now I'm facing with a lot of problems, but I will go to this 
passage of the Holy Quran, Faida hakam tum bainan nas antah kumu bilad. Saudara saudara, Mr. Didat, there is one question here. Now, could you elaborate about your statement in connection with Tunku's dialogue with the Pope? Now, can you come back to the microphone and answer this question? Elaborate that, and perhaps we would like to uh, know more of this, uh, if you have. That is my first question. You can use that microphone. Thank yes. you. You see, when I came to this beautiful country of yours in 1984, I met the Tunku, and he asked me, Ahmad, that's my name, he says, this dialogue of yours with the Pope, what happened? I says, no, no dialogue took place. You want to know why? I says, no, His Holiness didn't mean the dialogue in the sense which the Quran speaks. The Quran, Allah wants us to have a dialogue with Him, with the Christians. Ta'ala, come, talk about Allah's unity. He is the one and only Allah that there is. This is what Allah wants us to talk. That we don't associate partners with Him. Talk about that. So, when the, His Holiness was making proclamations, like He's making today, you must see the star, this morning star. He wants to have a dialogue with the Muslims. So, after many years of waiting, I wrote to His Holiness that I am prepared to come over to the Vatican and ha have a dialogue with His Holiness. Because the Bible says have a dialogue and the Quran says we must have a dialogue. So there was no reply. So I sent him another letter, there was no reply. So I sent him a telegram. His Holiness the Pope, I sent him a telegram. So I get a response telling me that he's prepared to receive me in private, in his secretariat. So I wrote back, asking him, how big is your secretariat? Because this is not a private matter. A dialogue with the Muslims is not a private matter between Ahmad Didat and the Pope, that I go and enjoy a cup of tea with him and have a nice good time and he gives me a gilt edge Bible as a present and I come and tell the people, I says, you know, I went to the Pope and he gave me tea and he kissed my hands. This is boosting, wanting to boost my ego. What a great guy I am. I said, no, this is not a private matter. The whole Muslim world wants to know. The Christian world wants to know. What are you people talking? So how big is your secretariat? Because three plain lords of Muslims are coming from South Africa alone. Youth from Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town. And from the Middle East and from the UK. How big is your secretariat? No answer. Again, no answer. Actually, he didn't mean that dialogue. He is telling his people, go and preach to the Muslims. Go and convert them. But he doesn't use the word convert because you're going to react. So the best way is to talk about a dialogue. This, this morning's paper, dialogue. I go to Birmingham delivering a lecture. And in that lecture, I meet Dr. Abdullah Nasif of the Rabita. So he's asking me, Ahmad, what happened about your dialogue with the Pope? So I told him, I says, you know, uh, this was just a hoax. He didn't really mean a dialogue in what sense we understand. What Allah wants us to talk about, no, not about that. So he says, you know, he did it to me too. Dr. Nasif, he says, he did it to me. I said, what did he do? He said, he called me for a dialogue and I went. You know, simple people, he said, and I went. And he goes. He said, they made me to wait at the Vatican in a waiting room. After 10 minutes into another higher grade waiting room, after another 10 minutes, still higher grade waiting room, and in comes His Holiness. Embraces him, kisses his hand, fantastic, fantastic gentleman. Say, are you from Egypt? Dr. Nasir says, no, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Meaning that the guy didn't know, or maybe he was expecting somebody from Egypt. So what's the dialogue? He says, you know, you people don't allow us to build more, uh, churches in your country. And it happens. Saudi Arabia is the only Muslim country in the world where there is not a church. Only Muslim country in the whole vast world. He says, you people don't allow us to build churches in your country. So 
Dr. Nasib, a talented gentleman, a well-witted man, he is telling His Holiness, is telling His Holiness that you allow us to build mosque in the Vatican. He says, no, I don't mean Makkah and Medina, but in the rest of the country. So Dr. Nasib said, look, the, to us, the whole of Saudi Arabia is our Vatican. If your Vatican is 10 square miles or 100 square miles, whole of Saudi Arabia is our Vatican, is a holy land for us. Then when I come to your country here, Tunku Abdul Rahman, Tunku Abdul Rahman, he is asking me the same question, and I told him, so he says, Ahmad, the guy did it to me too. I said, what did he do? He said, he called me for a dialogue, and I went. When I was around Egypt, he says, I went to the Vatican, to Italy, to the Vatican, and they received me well. Same treatment, first grade of waiting room, second grade higher up, third grade, and in comes the Pope. Charming, charming, kissing your hand, anything he will do. And the dialogue starts. What dialogue? The dialogue is, he says, you know, Tunku, sir, in Sabah, two of our Catholic priests have been caught dr drug trafficking, dada, and they will die. Can't you intercede with the Sabah government on my behalf? That is the dialogue? No. Allah Bari Ta'ala is telling us to have a dialogue with them on the basis that there is but one Allah, worship Him, don't associate partners with Him, don't take others as lords and patrons other than Allah. So the dialogue with the Tunku was of another kind, the dialogue with the Abdullah Nasi was of another kind, not the type of dialogue that we are talking about come, let us reason together on the worship of the one true God. Thank you, Sheikh Didat. Now, really we have this question, a beautiful one. You have answered that very nicely. Now, if the, the non-Muslim ask, what is Islam? What are we supposed to, how do we answer that question? What if a non-Muslim asks, what is Islam? They don't know about Islam. They want to ask you, what is Islam? Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Simple words. Yes, thank you. Islam is a religion of God. There is no such thing as Judaism and there is no such thing as Christianity. Look, don't be shocked. I reason with you. We want to know from Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, if we can meet him, we ask him, O oh Moses, Hazrat Musa, what is your religion? And I assure you, he can never say Judaism, because that is the term, the word he never heard in his life. This term Judaism was invented long after Musa alayhi salam. The people around Judea, around Palestine, they, when they saw the children of Judah, in Judea, the religion that they practice, the people from the outside, they said, this is the Judaism, is the religion of the children of Judah in Judea. That's how the name Judaism came about. But Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, if you can ask him, he would tell you that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. That's his definition. And one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means a religion of total submission to God's will. The religion of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. If we can have the privilege of meeting him at his second coming, ask him, O oh, Isa alayhi salam, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Christianity because he never heard the word Christ, he never heard the word Christian, he never heard the word Christianity. Look, this is all biblical. The first time the word Christian was ever used in the Bible is in the book of Acts at Antioch. The enemies of the followers of Jesus disparagingly they pointed to them saying that these are Christians, meaning the worshippers of Christ. Jesus is not expected to say that I'm a Christian because if he said I'm a Christian, we can ask him what church you belong to. Are you a Jehovah's Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist or a Mennonite or a Mormon? What are you? Are you a Roman Catholic? What are you? We expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. And one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means a religion of total submission to the will of God. Thank you very much, Sheikh Didat. And I think uh, time is running. And uh, we have just... Uh, the questions that you have given us will be noted and will take along to South Africa and we shall individually, individually write you back. Provided that you, in your, let, your, your questioning, you go back and get them back and write your name and addresses on that, on that questions. Now, Mr. Didat, I want to thank you very, very much for your very interesting talks on the 
Islam and we have been very very uh, happy indeed at least you could make it this evening and before we close I would like to thank Mr. Mr. Chairman I saw dozens of questions in the box there and you ended with two I don't know the people are they satisfied if they are satisfied I'm quite happy I'm an old man of 74 I can go to sleep now I have another program tomorrow morning if you people are tired I'm prepared to go but I saw dozens there, dozens. I can't understand why in two questions, you know, the meeting is closed. I can't understand. I don't know. I'm very sorry indeed, Mr. Didat, but I think 10, 15, and 10, uh, now is already 10, 15. Tomorrow is a working day in this country. And uh, as I said, as I said to you, you can ask any questions, but you ask and let them answer to you directly. You have got time to talk to them. <laughs> And the meeting is adjourned. You are hypocrite!